Well, we've been in the middle of our series that we have titled Mighty. Um, and for those of you who maybe don't know what a series is, uh, it's simply that we take a couple of weeks and we dedicate those few weeks to really digging into a concept. We spend some time, and usually it's about four weeks. We like to try to break them up in about a month's time. Uh, and my dad will be closing out Mighty next week. Uh, and then we're getting ready for our next series, which is going to be amazing. But we're in week three right now of our Mighty series and really just talking about the attributes of God and how he is so mighty to save us, to lead us, and this morning we're going to talk about that our God is mighty, that his love, his presence, his affection towards us is mighty. So I want to say welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. I mean, you could be anywhere else, but you chose to be here in Buffalo. Thank you so much for showing up and being so faithful. I mean, you win just because you showed up this morning. That's the truth. And... I hope that you're blessed by what I'm about to say, but can I tell you something? The presence of God and spending a moment with community, with family, in the presence of the Lord, that's got enough power to transform you in every possible way. So, so we're going to talk about that this morning, this concept of mighty to love, mighty to love. And we're going to go to a passage of scripture. It's Luke 23. And for those of you who are familiar with this passage of scripture, you're going to know that typically this passage of scripture is exclusively reserved for Easter. And in case you didn't realize, it is not Easter. Uh, it is the third week of October. And so you might ask, why would we be talking about an Easter passage not at Easter? We're going to talk about the, the crucifixion of Jesus. And the reason why I've chosen this passage this morning is that in John 15, 13 tells us this, that Greater love has no one than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And really, the crucifixion scripture, while we celebrate it for so many different reasons, Jesus is amazing, and you can draw your entire existence in Christianity because of the cross and what Jesus did for us. But this morning I thought that there's no greater passage of scripture to talk about than the scripture that Jesus says this is the greatest act of love that anyone in humanity can have for someone else, that they would give their very life for someone else. I'm hoping that the conclusion that we can draw this morning together is that Jesus' love is otherworldly, that it is so beyond anything that we are familiar with in our life that sometimes his love can be highly misunderstood. And I found that oftentimes his love can often be misused because the expression of love that he has is so intense, it's so selfless, it's so powerful that we can often miss the intensity of the meaning because it's, we have nothing to compare it to in our life. And I guess I wanted to start this sermon off this morning by asking you, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, of course, I think the question is rather rhetorical, how many of you battle feeling guilty? Right? How many of you battle feeling guilty? You know, you, you do the wrong things, you say the wrong things, you feel guilty because you did something, you feel guilty because you didn't do something. You feel guilty because you said something. You feel guilty because you didn't say something, right? And, and I actually recently read a study about guilt. Uh, and, and as, you know, I'm sure that we're all familiar with this, especially during our COVID diet, uh, is that food guilt is actually one of the main things that people feel guilty about. In fact, the study said that about one third of all the food that we eat we feel guilty about eating this food. Now, men typically feel guilty for about 20 minutes post-meal. Uh, and women, which I will, I'm not going to jump into this at all this morning because it's not my message. Women feel guilty significantly longer. <laughs> Maybe you feel Christian guilt, right? Maybe you feel guilty because you don't pray enough. You feel guilty because you don't serve enough. Maybe you feel guilty because you forgot to read your Bible this morning. One of the things that I get to see often with lots of moms around me is mom guilt. 
right? Moms feel guilty because they work and then they feel guilty because they don't work, right? They feel guilty because they see other moms and their Pinterest Instagram lives and they're making all the snacks and doing all the stuff and you just forgot to pick your kid up from school and you feel mom guilt, right? Then there's general guilt that we feel all the time, right? Feel guilty because we don't want to let people down. And then we feel guilty because we can't say no to things, but then we feel guilty because we said yes to the thing that we should have said no to. We feel guilty because we left our dog at home. We feel guilty because our closets are full, and yet we still want more clothes. We feel guilty because our marriages maybe didn't work. We feel guilty when we fail, but then we feel guilty when we succeed. We feel guilty when we work too hard, but then we feel guilty when we take time off. We feel guilty maybe because we took the Lord's name in vain. We feel guilty because we betrayed a friend. We feel guilty because we love Jesus, but yet we still do the wrong things. This is why I said my question was rhetorical, because really it seems as though you can't escape guilt inside of our culture. I mean, I feel pastor guilt often, I feel guilty because I should preach better. I feel guilty should I, I should love better. I feel guilty because I should just be better. I feel guilty because I spend too much time with my family and I should be spending more time here, but then I spend more time here and not with my family and I feel guilty because I'm not spending more time with my family. <laughs> guilt. And in Luke chapter 23, we're going to talk about Jesus describing the last few hours of his life. And, you know, we hail Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we celebrate him as this triumphant king. And yet the last few hours of his life as this triumphant king are rather surprising. You know, instead of wearing a golden crown, we see Jesus wearing a crown of thorns. Instead of being surrounded by servants, we see Jesus is surrounded by thieves. Instead of sitting on a throne, we see that he is nailed and hanging on a cross. It's surprising that someone who can be held as this triumphant king can spend the last moments of his life in this position. And this is what he says in Luke chapter 23. We see this discourse between Jesus has at this point been hung on the cross. He's gone through the entire passion sequence. He's been convicted, wrongly convicted. He's been betrayed. He's been whipped to the point of death. He's been forced to, after that, carry his cross to his place of execution. He's wearing a crown of thorns. He's been mocked and spit at and ridiculed and he finally finds himself, the son of God, hanging between two criminals. And this is what it says in Luke 23, verse 32. Two other men, this is referring to the two men that were also crucified at the same time as Jesus, and they go on to describe them, both criminals, were also led out to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him, him being Jesus, there along with these criminals, one on his right and another on his left. Let me ask you this question, and we're going to get into this a little bit later. How many people, and I'm hoping that you all will answer because it's just more fun when we do things together. How many people were hanging on the cross? Three of you responded. That was a hint. How many people were hanging on a cross? How many people were hanging on the cross? My dad said all of them. That is correct. Three of them. Three of them were hanging on the cross. Now, I think it's important that we understand a little bit what crucifixion was. Because crucifixion, um, you know, we, we, it's, it's almost become such a common thing inside of the Christian religion that we don't necessarily understand what crucifixion was actually reserved for. And that if you were to be chosen to be executed by crucifixion, it was a demonstration to the rest of the world that you were the worst of the worst. That crucifixion was reserved for, you know, not the pickpockets, you know, not for somebody who had a couple unpaid parking tickets. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst of the worst criminals. 
Because in all of human history, it's considered to be the most horrible form of death. Yes, physically, because of the intense anguish that you would go through physically, but it was also spiritually and emotionally shameful. In fact, the Jewish people held, there's a scripture that says that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. It was the most shameful way for you to exit this world. In fact, the word, we, we use this word that he was an excruciating pain. We use that term in our culture today, but that word is actually the Latin word. I'm not going to say the two Latin words, but the word excruciating actually means out of the cross. That Ravi Zacharias had described it, that crucifixion literally was the defining word for pain. But now beyond that, we have to remember that Jesus wasn't just nailed on the cross. We know that first came the scourging, the, the whipping that we see if you've watched The Passion of the Christ. And this entailed you were whipped 39 times because they had understood that 39 times was the most lashes that anyone could take without the, the outcome of that lashing being death. So they knew 39 times we could put you in the worst possible pain but yet we know that you'll live so that after it, we can crucify you. When they were whipped, you know, often we see whips. If you watched Indiana Jones, you've seen a whip. And no, Jesus was not whipped with an Indiana Jones style whip. He was whipped with what was called a cat of nine tails. And what it was, it was a whip that had obviously nine tails. But on the end of those, there was glass, there was bone, there was nails woven into it. So that way, when they would whip you, they would catch into your flesh and it would rip you out. It was said about uh, 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 um, when people were whipped that it was often that their internal organs would begin to spill out. That it was said about Jesus that he was absolutely unrecognizable. The loss of blood intense, leaving you obviously in a state of shock. And this is how most people were. They, beyond that, they were stripped naked as people watched in on them and they literally hung their shackled to a post, hanging in shame. Then they would give them a little bit of time to recover because they wanted to make sure that you could carry the cross to your eventual place of execution. Then you were nailed to the cross. It was, they were nailed kind of in the wrist bone here so that way it could hold you sturdily to it and the spikes that were driven through were approximately seven inches long. And now you wouldn't, it was intentional in this because you wouldn't die immediately. You would actually eventually die from asphyxiation or suffocation, or maybe you die literally from pure exhaustion, just hanging and baking in the desert sun. And because of this, because of the, 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 the people that they chose to crucify this way, they chose it because it would take days for people to die. And that it was very expensive because you had to have four Roman guards standing watch for four days to make sure that nobody comes in the middle of the night and takes these people down. In fact, it was considered an act of mercy. On the fourth day, the Roman soldiers would come and they would break your legs so that you couldn't hold yourself up anymore and catch your breath and you would die quicker. We see from this, I'm not sure what the other criminals did in order to be hung on the cross, but we know that the crimes that they committed were serious. They were serious crimes. And on top of the physical agony, we know that people gathered and mocked Jesus. We know that they cursed at him. They spit on him. They viled him, they laughed at him, they cursed him, and yet in the middle of it, we see this discourse. We see this moment as Jesus is hanging on the cross and he prays. Now he prays a very, very different prayer than I would have prayed. <laughs> I would have prayed something like, Father, 
kill all these jerks. Oh God, I hate them all. Just rain down fire. I know you promised to never flood the earth again, but this moment is the moment to break that promise. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus, after going through everything that I just explained to you, prays this prayer. Come on, if we can't see love, the intensity of God's love towards us in this. He prays this prayer about the people who've just done these horrible things to him. He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. And then in verse 20, 39, it says this, Luke 23, 39, it says, One of the criminals who hung there starts hurling insults at Jesus, right? He makes this statement. He says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. And, you know, we see very quickly that this was an arrogant, rude, prideful man. But the truth is that he's guilty. He's a guilty man. And we see this discourse that he has. Is he's basically saying that I have no need for a savior. I have no need for who you are, Jesus. And, and then we see this moment after is that the other criminal who's hanging to one of his sides begins to rebuke the first guy for rebuking Jesus. He says this in verse 40. But the other criminal rebuked him and says this, don't you fear God? He says, since you're under the same sentence, for we are punished justly, we're getting what our deeds deserve. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, man, like, stop mocking this guy. Because everything that's happening to us, we've done to deserve this. We've been judged correctly for what we've done. In, in other words, he's saying, we're getting what we deserve. Now, I wonder if you can help me finish some of these common phrases. You could say them out loud. What goes around comes around. Your past will come back to haunt you. You live by the sword, you die by the sword, right? And these are all different ways inside of our culture that have let us know, hey man, careful, because you're going to get what you deserve, and here's the truth, if I could take a minute and be honest, right? There is a unsaved part of me, sick, sick, dark part of me that loves, oh, I love when people get what they deserve, right? Especially when I'm driving on the highway, you know, minding my own business, and some guy in a sports car thinks he owns the road and blows past me at 160, and then I'm driving and not three, four kilometers later, and I see, woo, 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 and the guy's pulled over on the side of the road, and I'm like, yeah, Lord, oh, thank you, Jesus, for the justice of God that he gets. But now, except for me, right, because when I'm speeding and I see that, woo, I'm like, mercy, please, God, don't let me get what I deserve. Right, is that the truth? It's a sick part of me. Pray for me. I need, I need God. That's what he says in Luke 23, 41. We are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he says this to Jesus. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, I want to take a second in a moment and talk about what Jesus says, but I'm going to tell you something what Jesus didn't say. You know, Jesus doesn't, here's this guy, start talking, and he doesn't say to him, listen, man, I never liked you. I'm here just trying to die in peace, and the two of you are arguing. He's like, no, 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 man, you're going to hell, buddy. There's nothing you could do. You've done too much. You're too bad. It's, there's no hope for you anymore. It's too late, too little, too late. And sorry. He doesn't say this. Let me tell you what Jesus says and who he says it to. Jesus says to a thief who couldn't do anything to earn right standing with God. He says it to a thief who couldn't walk the straight and narrow because his feet were bound to a cross. He 
couldn't perform any good works because his hands were nailed to his side. He couldn't turn over a new leaf because his life was ending potentially that day. He couldn't join a church. He couldn't do anything right. And Jesus answered him and says this, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Can I tell you something? Even though you cannot earn it, even though none of us in this room deserve it, Jesus' love is mighty enough to cross whatever divide, to cross whatever issue, to cross whatever problem you might be facing this morning. Jesus says it doesn't matter what you came here with. My love, not your love, not what you can do, my love. My love will make up the difference to do what you could never do on your own to give you something you could never earn on your own. You know, when I read this passage of scripture, I stop a minute and I, you know, the the parts of me, the, you know, the good Christian parts of me want to be like, wait a minute, Jesus, you know, this isn't fair, right? Like, where's the justice? So this life all about justice and this guy is guilty. He, he deserves to die. I realized something that none of us deserve this love. And you know how I know that? Is that I don't deserve it. I don't deserve to be preaching today. I don't deserve to be standing up here delivering this word. You know, because this... My story was their story. You know, I grew up in church. I'm pretty sure I got saved when I was three, prayed in tongues when I was three and a half, was the good boy. You know, I stood on a Bible to make sure that I could pay attention to what was happening in worship. I went to church. Correction. I was forced to go to church. I knew about God, but I didn't know him. And I messed up my life. You know, I lied a lot. I lied to the point where I actually started to believe my own lies. I stole, got brought home by the cops a couple of times for stealing. I cheated, you know, smart kid, going into a great university program, but cheated my way to getting there. I hated people. I partied drank, I did drugs, I sinned sexually. And so finally, and I know that a lot of you are familiar with this, I woke up one day and looked in the mirror and I realized, I hate who I am. I was full of shame. I literally felt dead on the inside. No hope, no life, no joy. No purpose, no vision, no direction. Now, many of you obviously know my story is, you know, I realized that I could never turn my life around in the midst of my life, and I moved to Backwoodsville, Nowhere Town, Texas, Garden Valley, Texas. I joined an internship because I knew I needed something radical to happen if I was going to ever turn my life around. One of the things about this internship was they had Bible memorization class where they forced us in order to remain in the program. We had to memorize passages of scripture and then we would be tested on them. And, and I can remember that I read this scripture once. It was one of the scriptures that we had to memorize and I still carry it with me today. And, and I read this scripture, but I don't know how many of you felt this. As I'm reading it, the scripture, I felt like the scripture was reading me. And all of the sudden... Everything I had learned, everything I knew, everything I had been taught, it all of a sudden clicked. This is what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Like the rest of us, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because, come on, verse 4 says this, but because of his great love for us. God, 
who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Come on, church, can I tell you, this is the best news. This is literally the gospel of Jesus Christ. That what we could do nothing to earn, Jesus steps down from heaven and chooses to embody love and sacrifice his life so that we could come back in right relationship with God. Eight and nine goes on to say it like this, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's something that you could do on your own. It's not something that you could ever earn. You could never be good enough to deserve God's love. He says this, it's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Can I tell you something? This is our story. This is who we are. We are undeserving. We are unworthy. We are guilty. We are deserving of all the bad stuff that happens to us. But Jesus comes, the perfect one, and sacrifices his very life so that we can have the very thing that we don't deserve. This is what grace and mercy are all about. Mercy is all about me not getting what I do deserve. And grace is all about me, me getting what I don't deserve. This is what Jesus came to do. Not only did he come to take away what I do deserve, but he comes and gave his life so that I could have the very things like salvation that I don't deserve. This is why I'm so passionate about God. This is why, you know, people say that to me, you know, you're so loud, which I take as passionate. (laughs) Because I've realized something that I don't deserve anything that I am, anything that I have. When I look at my kid and when I look at my wife and when I walk into my house and I drive my car, I realize, man, I deserve none of this. But it makes me so aware that his love is so mighty that it crosses the divide, that it does something in me and to me. And when I become so aware of it, it begins to change the very outlook that I have on my life. His love is so mighty. I think this is what the writer of Amazing Grace realized. That God uses the filthy, the guilty, the selfish wretch Not because of how good we are. Not because of how many good things you can do. I mean, do good things. We want to do good things. But it's not because of the good things that you do that God loves you, that he chooses you, that he uses you and anoints you and qualifies you and calls you and blesses you and changes you. It's not because of how good we are. It's because of how good he is. His love is mighty. That's why in Psalm 103, I love it, it says this. For he, God, does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. That he has removed our sin as far from us as the east is from the west. This is how good our God is. Yes, you might feel guilty. Yes, you might have done some stuff. Yes, you don't deserve it. But that's the gospel. That's literally what Jesus came to do for us. His love came and removed the curse. You know, I asked you earlier, how many people were on the cross? How many people were on the cross? Three. Thank you, all three of you. (laughs) And there's a study of scripture that's called numerology. Anybody know what numerology is? It's the study of numbers, okay? It's one of the things you realize about the Bible, that 
if you just read the Bible on surface, you're missing a ton of the story because as God-inspired scripture, it's amazing as you dig how much is actually in there that we miss. That the entire scripture is a prophetic message to us about what Jesus is going to do to rescue God's children and bring them back into right relationship with him. That literally from the very beginning of the story, God was prophetically announcing what Jesus was going to do. In word, yes, but also as crazy as it's going to sound right now, in numbers. Okay? So number one means the unity. It means unity. It means God, right? That God is one. Things like number four, when you here, see things number four, or in pairs of four, it's talking about the earth. Number five is typically a number of grace. Number seven is the number of perfection, right? We know that God rested on the day seven. He was, his earth was so perfect. Seven is the number of perfect. Number six is often a number of man, okay? Or it can also denounce the devil, right? We know 666 is the number of the devil. Eight is a number of new beginnings. 40, for example, is a number of like testing and trials. But three, three is the number of wholeness and completion. Come on, let me tell you something. Oh, this is good. Watch this. God is Trinity, right? We know that God is three in one. He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is complete in himself. We know that our physical nature is often broken down into three things, body, soul, and spirit. We know that when God is described, he's described as omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. He's omniscient, which means he's all-knowing. And he is omnipotent, which means he is all-powerful. Okay? Revelation talks about God, that he's the God who was, is, and is to come. Three. God's grace manifests itself in three ways. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Okay? In the Old Testament... There were three fathers, Abraham, come on people, Isaac, and Jacob. The tabernacle has three sections. It has the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. The angels, when they cried out, they cried out three times, holy, 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 right? Daniel prays, how many times? Three times a day. Jonah was in the belly of a whale, three days. Come on people, this is not coincidence. The New Testament has 27 books, and this is a stretch. 27, three times three times three. Paul was blind for three days. He prayed for the thorn in his side to be removed three times. He was stranded on Malta for three months after being shipwrecked. Jesus was born, and he was visited by three wise men who brought him three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In his early ministry, when, you know, when he was about 12 years old, he was separated from his parents three days. His public ministry lasted three years. Started when he was 30, ended when he was 33. Jesus was tempted three times in the wilderness. Come on, people. He has 12 disciples. Three of them were in the inner circle. Peter, James, and John. These were the ones who witnessed Jesus at the transfiguration. Jesus predicted that Peter would deny him three times. Peter denies Jesus three times. Three times, Jesus says, and establishes his great love for Peter. God spoke audibly about his son, Jesus, three times. Jesus raised three people from the dead, Lazarus, the widow's son, and Jairus' daughter. Jesus prays three times in the Garden of Gethsemane. Tradition says that he, was, he fell three times while he was carrying the cross. And he was one of three men who hung on the cross. The sign above his head was written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. He was placed on the cross at the third hour of the day. At the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., he declared three words of victory. It is finished. Right? It says that the earth trembled and darkness fell on the land for three hours. On the third day, love rose again. That it broke the divide. It broke the curse. Now that love is here. Can I tell you something? There is nothing past, present, future. The Paul tells us there is nothing in the whole world that could possibly separate us. 
Come on, from the mighty love that God has for us. Can I tell you something? Yeah. If you feel guilty, if you feel unworthy, if you feel unlovable, if you feel ashamed, Jesus literally wrote the whole Bible to tell us that we're not complete, we're not whole because of what we can do. We are complete because of his mighty love. I'm not here because I'm good. I'm here because of how good he is. Come on, you can just praise the Lord for just one second because that is some good news. It's good news that nothing can separate you from his love. Come on, that's the best news there is. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what they said. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter your gender or your skin color. Nothing can separate you from his love. We're not here because we are good. We're here because he is good. Amen. Come on, if we could just take a second. I'm gonna ask us to do something. Let's take a moment of privacy and concentration because I believe that when God releases information, he desires to bring transformation. And I'm gonna ask you this with every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're finding yourself in this room right now and you'd say, that's me. Man, I live, Alex, I live with a guilty conscience. I live feeling unworthy. I live feeling ashamed. I live feeling like I can't do enough to earn his love. I'm here to give you some good news. It was never about what you could do. But I'm gonna ask something. I'm gonna count to three. I literally cannot see you because the lights are so bright. I'm gonna ask that on the count of three, you just slip up your hand because there's something that happens inside when you respond outside. If that's you on the count of three, one, two, three, just lift your hand up real quick. You can put it right down as soon as you're there. I'm not trying to embarrass you and all of our campuses online. I believe that Jesus is gonna change something in our heart this morning. So let me pray for you, Heavenly Father. We ask for your presence this morning. We ask for your goodness in our life. We choose as an act of our will to strip from ourselves, to loose from ourselves this guilty, sin-focused consciousness and nature. And we choose to bind to ourselves the truth that says, you are good, that your love is mighty. We choose from this moment forward not to judge our standing with you based off of what we can do, but we're judging it based off of what you have done for us. Before I close, I'm gonna ask, if you're at home, if you're in one of our campuses, you're new here, maybe you've been here for a while and you're saying, I feel all those things and I need this Jesus, but I don't know him. I've never formally entered into a relationship with him. The Bible tells us it's very simple. It's very clear that if we confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus is the son of God, that he's the savior sent from heaven to earth to die for our sins, that that's all we need to do. It's the confession of our mouth that brings us into relationship with him. So I'm gonna ask everybody in this campus, everybody in our other campuses, if you're online, let's just repeat this together as one big family together. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I'm, a sinner, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I need a savior. Jesus, Jesus, I believe, I believe that, you're the Son of God, that you are the Son of God sent from heaven, sent from heaven to, be my savior. to be my Savior. I receive, I receive the, payment the payment that you paid, that you paid on, the cross. on the cross. I choose. I choose. I choose you. I choose you. I choose you. I choose you. To be my savior and my Lord. To be my savior and my Lord. Fill me. Fill me. Use me. Use me. Change me. Change me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' Come name. Come on, everybody. Let's make a big hallelujah Yay! show.